Well, hello, family. My name is Pastor Wesley Shell, and I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in. We hope that we can meet you one Sunday morning here in Harrisburg, North Carolina at either our 9.15 or 11 a.m. service. But if not, if you're already attending a church or you live far away, listen, we believe in this Bible to be cover to cover truth, that it is still the inspired word of God. So I pray that the word of God would change you and make an impact on you and your family today. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray as we break apart this chapter of Romans, that you would transform our hearts. She would sow seeds of your word in our heart, and it would bear fruit through our life. God, we give you glory for all that you will do today as we come to this altar in just a few moments to allow you to move, to grow our faith so that we can stand strong in who you are and who you call us to be. We will give you all the glory in the name of Jesus, everybody said. Amen. We are in the middle of a sermon series, walking through chapter by chapter in the book of Romans. Before we read the passage, I just want to introduce myself. If it's your first time, my name is Pastor Wesley Shell. I'm so honored to be a small cog in the wheel of Multiply Church Harrisburg. There's a cool picture when I used to have hair that made me look like I'm from Whoville. And this is my beautiful family, my wife, Crystal, um, who you saw just a moment ago, and my two little girls, Henley Ray and Harper Rose. And we would love to meet you next week. We have something called Party with the Pastors, which is in that room right there after both services next week to where we get the opportunity to sit down and hear your story and tell you a little bit about ours. Because we don't want to just do church together. We want to do life together. Amen. How many people know you need people in life? Romans chapter 4, we're walking through an expository preaching series. What does that mean? That just means that we simply preach the scripture in its entirety and exactly in the way that God intended it to be read because I'm not here to tell you my opinion. I'm not here to make you feel good. I'm not here to do anything else than preach the word of God and allow the truth of what he says to transform your life like it says in Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true in proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's a lot of things in this world that can change your mind, but the only thing that can transform it is the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are believing for him to continue to do that as he has from the start of this series. So Romans chapter 4, we're going to read through the whole chapter together. If you're ready to read along, say yes. If you have your Bible, if you have your telephonic Bible and you can pick your translation, I will be reading out of the NLT. Abraham was, humanely speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God if his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about, but that was not God's way. For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something that they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God, who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Oh, what joys for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yet what joy for those who record the Lord has cleared of sin. Now is the blessing only for the Jews, or is it also for the uncircumcised Gentiles? Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous because God, because by God because of his faith. But how did this happen? Was he counted as righteous only after he was circumcised, or was it before he was circumcised? Clearly, God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised, because circumcision was a sign that Abraham had already had faith. And that God had already accepted and declared him to be righteous, even before he was circumcised. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith, but not have been circumcised. They are counted righteous because of their faith. And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised, but only if they have some kind of faith Abraham had before he was circumcised. Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. If God's promise is the 
is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. For the law was always, uh, which always brings punishment on those who try to obey it, the only way to avoid breaking the law was to have no law at all. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham's, for Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have, and Abraham's faith did not weaken. Even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. In this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him. The one who raised Jesus, the Lord, from the dead, he was handed over to die because of our sins. And he was raised to life to make us right with God. If you read uh, Romans chapter 3 and then Romans chapter 4, you see that this is just merely an example of what Romans chapter 3 preaches. The life of Abraham is a perfect reflection to the life of some man of what God teaches us, what Paul has written to the church in Romans chapter 3. And it's that if we were to rely on our obedience to the law to receive salvation, we would fail. Actually, in the Old Testament, there was over 600 commandments. We talked about this last week. How many people know that they would have broken at least 300 by the time they were 12? Those who have children, you know your children have broken at least 400 of them by the time they are however old they are. If we had to rely upon our perfect obedience to the law, then we would never be able to receive the gift of heaven. But God loves us so much that he gifted us this mighty gift of grace that is sufficient for our shortcomings. So Paul is teaching the church, and Abraham is showing us that it's not just about the obedience to the law, but you must have Faith in God. This is the word that I want to talk about, that I believe that it's an underlying word that's continuously talked about in this chapter. Uh, And I know that it's used just as much as the word circumcision, but we're going to focus on faith today. It's so funny in first service, everybody, how many times does he have to say this word? Well, we're going to read the whole Bible. But I want to talk about the word it consistently speaks about, about in Abraham's faith and the faith that you and I are called to have because this word faith is the very cornerstone of who we are. This word faith is the very thing that's necessary in order for you and I to receive this gift of heaven that God has offered to us, that he has made a way for. Faith is believing in something even though you may not see it. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather live a life If faith didn't have to be there, because I'm what they call, in a medical term, a control freak. I would really like to be able to control the situation, know the outcome, know every direction that it's going to take. I'm not a big surprise guy. Neither is my wife. The one time she almost broke up with me when we were dating is because I threw her a surprise birthday party. I learned real quick that's not the way that she wants to feel loved. I would love to know the answer to every situation, to every problem that we face. I would love to to have an easy button for everything in life. You guys remember when that came out and it's just a button because we love the sound of, well, that was easy. Because I've quickly learned in life also, I, I thought the older that you got, the easier things got. Surely after you've been married for five years, it gets much easier. Surely after you've had kids for this long, life gets much easier. Surely after you graduate high school, oh, when you become adult, life's just so easy. And then you have bills start showing up in your mailbox. 
What is that? We got gypped. And you think everything's going to get easier, but it doesn't. And we want to live this life that's easy, that we understand everything, and we have the control of every situation. But as a believer, this is where faith fills the gap. Because if, it, if we don't have faith, then we don't need God. But our faith is our reliance upon God is sovereign, that he is all-powerful, that he is all-knowing, and that he will make a way. Faith is the very cornerstone that you and I stand on. And without faith, we cannot claim to be a believer. Faith is trusting in God, even though you don't see it, even though you don't know the direction, even though you don't have control. We must stand on faith because it is by grace or it is by faith through grace that you and I have been saved. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the ABCs of the gospel. This is another statement that I want you to write down. Because if you want to explain what salvation is, it is by faith in God, through the grace of God, that we are able to see heaven. By faith and entrusting him with our life and believing that he died on the cross for us and proclaiming that he is Lord. And through the grace which he sent his son down to live a perfect life that you and I can never live, to die a death that you and I deserve, to rise again three days later. By the way that he paved it, by that road called grace, we are able to walk in faith in a relationship with him. Faith is the very cornerstone that you and I stand on. We know that faith carries power, that faith, faith as small as a mustard seed can move what? And that's not a figure of speech. I believe that that is a very literal passage because when you give God control, anything can happen. Faith produces many things we're going to talk about today. The first one is that it produces hope in verse 18 through 21. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. Believing that he would become the father of many nations, for God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a hundred years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God, and he was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Abraham, at about a hundred years old, and Sarah about the same is given a promise by God that he was going to have a child. Some of us, some of you guys in the room are barely halfway there to 100, and you're like thinking, no, that's not possible. 100 years old, and God says, you are going to have a child, and you are going to be the father of many nations. Not only are you going to have one son, but your lineage is going to spread so vast it's going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. I don't know about you, but I would immediately say, God, but there's a lot of obstacles to get there. But Abraham wasn't focused on the obstacles. He was focused on the man he placed his hope in. Because when you have faith in God, it produces hope in every situation. That no matter how dark it may seem, no matter it, how hard it may be to get to the other side, as long as God is alive and this word is true, which we believe it is, it is yes and amen, that it is infinite, then there's hope. Somebody walked in this room today, and you faced something today, this week, or maybe even a year ago, and you're still walking through it to where it seems like, you know what, Pastor West, in this situation, there's just no hope. The enemy wants to rob you of your hope because he knows if he robs you of your hope, your hope is your motivation to move forward with the mission of the gospel. And if he takes your hope, you are no longer a threat. Because if he takes your hope, then it starts to leak into your faith. And if he takes your faith, then he's won. Somebody walked in here hopeless and you're thinking, the obstacle's too big. This, my, my child's never going to come back to Jesus. This relationship's never going to be restored. We're never going to be financially stable. Or whatever it may be, there is no such thing as a hopeless situation as long as the Lord is still on the throne. He's not leaving anytime soon. He's not leaving ever. And as long as you have faith in him, your faith in him will produce hope in your situation. 
God is a God who is still giving new dreams to even those who are old. I want to speak over somebody in this room that you are a seasoned saint. You have wisdom is what we call hair in youth ministry. That you have been around for a while and you think, you know what, it's just time. I did my work. I rode the ride. We're good. God wants to breathe new dreams into you today. He is not done using you because you have been used in past seasons. Even those who have put in work and have now taken this season of pause. God wants to breathe new dreams and new visions and new promises inside of you. Because as long as he's alive, there's hope. But faith produces hope. And you must place your faith in him. Satan will try and take your hope. For without hope, there there is no motivation to move forward. I told the story many times of how I ran a Spartan race uh, once many years ago. That was the first and last time that I'll ever do something like that, that I'll run on purpose and pay to run. I don't understand that. But it was, it was pretty cool. You get all muddy and, you know, you're, you're doing all these things. And I don't have great grips. Uh, my wrists are, are kind of uh, weak, I guess you would call. I mean, there's a couple things that I deal with in my, in my joints, and there was – moments where there was a rope climb and this rope was covered in mud and I've climbed the rope before but my body was just so tired and I had no hope I just ran over and started doing burpees if you couldn't do the obstacle you could move on if you wanted to but you had to do burpees and I know that my brother would never let me live it down if I skipped obstacles so I just some of these races and some of I just was like oh there's no hope I'm not even gonna try because if the enemy steals your hope he takes your motivation And when you stop trying and when you stop trying to talk to people and stop serving and you stop going and you stop giving and you stop doing all of these things and you just allow the hope to slowly backslide, it starts to deep de-root your faith. And when it de-roots your faith, when the winds and the waves come, it rips the tree right out from the ground. We must stay rooted in who the Father is. Because God is a God who brings hope to hopeless situations. In Luke chapter 8, there was a hopeless situation that he brings hope to. He was speaking to the woman with the issue of blood right after she had been healed by touching the hem of his garment. And a messenger arrived to the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. And the leader told him, your daughter is dead, for there's no use troubling the teacher now. Don't go talk to Jesus. She's already dead. But when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith, and she will be healed. When they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with him except for Peter, John, James, and the little girl's father and mother because the house was already filled with people weeping and wailing. And he said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead. She's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him because they all knew she had died. When Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned. And she immediately, say immediately, immediately stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were overwhelmed. But Jesus insisted that they not tell anyone what had happened. They had seen this moment of healing of the power of God. This woman who had dealt with the issue of blood for many, many years had sought out many, many doctors and found no solution. The moment she touches a piece of Jesus' robe, she's healed. There's this huge moment where hope is given. But then the leader of the synagogue is told his child is dead. Hey, don't don't go bother Jesus. There's no hope here. Don't, Don't go talk to Jesus. There's no hope here. And that's what the enemy tries to do to God's people. Hey, you don't even need to pray for this because there's no hope here. Hey, you don't need to bother God with your problems because it's already too far gone. Can I tell you, there's no such thing as too far gone in the Bible. This child was dead. No pulse. Can you imagine how heartbroken the people are as it says weeping and wailing. And Jesus walks into the room and says, hey, she's not dead, she's just sleeping. And the people are so hopeless that they have no other response than to laugh. They laugh at him, and he says, she's just sleeping. Jesus walks over to the girl and says, get up, my child. And immediately, she stands. In a situation that was deemed hopeless, that you and I would say, there's no, there's no possibility of healing. There's no even room for miracles. What can happen? It's already over. Can I tell you, that's what the enemy said when Jesus was in the tomb? It's already over. We won. 
And then what happened three days later? What happened three days later? Because it doesn't matter how dark the situation may seem in your life. The tomb may be covering the gate. The door may be shut. It may look impossible. It may seem hopeless. You may have dreams and promises in your life that you see and you think they, they are dead. But God is speaking over you. It's not dead. It's just sleeping. And he is going to breathe hope into your life. He's going to bring that child and that grandchild back to him through the conviction of his Holy Spirit. He's going to restore relationships. He's going to provide in your life because that's the kind of God that we serve. Faith moves mountains, but faith also brings healing. Faith also brings hope to hopeless situations. And if you're in here and you are hopeless today and your situation looks dead on the ground and you don't know what to do, all you've got to do is say, Jesus, it's right here. Faith produces hope. Faith not only produces hope, faith produces righteousness. Starting at verse 22 of Romans 4. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring that God will also count us as righteous. If we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. Because of Abraham's faith, he was called righteous. And not only was Abraham the beneficiary of this faith, but we were as well because faith produces righteousness. What is righteousness? Pastor Tony Evans says this, righteousness has to do with the vertical standard that God gives us to please him. And justice has to do with the horizontal expression of that righteous standard in the lives of others. Righteousness is a desire, a lifestyle that is desiring to please the father. Righteousness in simple man's terms is obedience It is a hunger to reflect the love of Jesus through your life, that we must live a life of righteousness. I believe the two least talked about things in the church is repentance and righteousness because neither one of them make us feel really good about ourselves. Because repentance is having to deal with the wrongdoings that you've made. Righteousness is having to choose things other than what you really want to do. It is combating your flesh. A life of righteousness is living in obedience. It's one that is wanting to reflect the love and the life of the Father through you. Righteousness is something that we were clothed in by the Father. Scripture says that we were filthy rags, that we were dead in our sin, that we were unqualified to enter heaven, but then he clothed us with his righteousness. You see, he didn't throw you in the washer machine and put you in the dryer. He said, no, I'm not going to just clean up what was old. I'm going to give you a new cloak of righteousness. That is who I am. So now you're not known as the addict. You're not known as the failure parent. You're not known as these things. Now you are clothed and known by my name. The cloaks, the coverings that people would wear used to be the symbol of the power that they carried. And now Jesus takes him, his power and his healing and his provision, and he covers you in it. So it's no longer about who you are, it's about who he is. He clothes you in his righteousness. Righteousness is a life that we live that is a life to desire to please the Father. And if you have faith in God, you will desire to live a righteous life. Righteousness is choosing to please the Spirit of God over your flesh. It's choosing to not gossip, but to tell people, hey, maybe we shouldn't be saying these things behind people's back. It is choosing to serve other people or to pray for the person that cuts you off at the bridge and not to curse them out. Sounds like some people have been tempted in the house to do that. (laughs) Righteousness is to choose to please the Father. And there's many situations in your life that you will want to respond in a way that is not righteous. And we will justify our own unrighteousness. Well, God, just let me have this one and then I'll be righteous everywhere else. Well, God, this person deserves to not see righteousness. They deserve to see wrath. The only person who will bring judgment and wrath is the Father himself, and that's, his, that's what he does. That's part of it. He is merciful, and he is just. He will bring healing. He will bring conviction to those people. It is your job to walk in righteousness, not to correct people. 
In this moment, God uses Abraham's faith as a template for what his people should look like. And as I was reading this passage, the Lord, I feel, prompted me to this question of, if your name was put in this place, what would the template of the believer look like? Abraham is now said that he's gonna be the father of many nations, that we should have faith like Abraham did, like the father did, and be counted as righteous in the benefit that he saw and now we receive. If we were to be put into this situation, what would faith look like for the believer? Do you claim faith or do you live a life full of faith? Because when you truly have faith in God, you desire to live a righteous life. I remember this movie called The Prince of Persia basically a knockoff version of Aladdin with time travel, so it just makes it confusing. But there's this moment where this young kid has no parents. He's probably eight years old, and he's walking through the town, and the only way that he can survive, the only way that he can find food is to steal. So he goes and he steals a piece of fruit from this piece. He doesn't have a pet uh, monkey, which would have been way cooler, but he goes and he steals a piece of fruit, and he gets caught by the soldiers. The soldiers catch him red hand, and what they actually would do in, in, in the Middle East anywhere is if you were a thief, you would lose your hand. You would no longer have the ability to steal things because you, don't, you can't grab it. They would cut your hand off, and the soldier caught him, and just in time, the king comes into the town. The king shows up, and the soldier's excited. Look, king, I caught a thief. I caught, a, I caught a sinner out here, and we're gonna take his hand off. I just wanted to show you how broken this person is and how much this kid is doing wrong. And instead of the king saying, yeah, take his hand off because that's what he deserves, he says, you know what? That kid's coming home with me. That kid is gonna be known as my son, and he was treated not as a thief, but as a prince as an heir to the throne, and this is exactly what God the Father did with you and me. We were thieves. We were dead in our sins. We sin still daily, even with good intentions, and we deserve to have worse than just our hand cut off. We deserve to live a life in the pit of hell, but God looked at us and said, you know what? I love you so much that you're not gonna be known by thief. You're not gonna be known by the brokenness of your sin, but put your faith in me and I will clothe you in my righteousness and you will no longer be known as these things. You will be known as a child of the one true king and an heir to the throne that when you have faith in God, you are now no longer who you used to be. You are found in the image that God created you for and that's to live in a relationship with him because he is preparing a place for you it's better than any house you could ever find on zillow better prices the economy <laughs> it doesn't change in heaven it's place your faith in god and you will see the promises of heaven faith produces righteousness that's come from the Father and not from you and from me because we could never live a perfectly righteous life, but we serve a perfectly righteous God. As the band comes and helps me close, faith produces hope, faith produces righteousness, and faith produces the impossible. Verse 16 through 17, let's go back just a little bit. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's, for Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. The promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. Free, uh, free gift in the Greek is charis, which means grace or undeserved favor. It is a favor that we do not deserve by placing your faith in God. You are the bene beneficiary of a gift that you do not deserve because it is by faith in God, through the grace of God, we will see heaven. Faith produces the impossible. I don't know about you, but I wanna be a church that normalizes the impossible. God takes the impossible and he makes it possible. He takes a situation that has no hope and he brings hope. He takes people that are full of depression. Many times that I've talked to guys, just another one in our softball league that I won't mention names, who's walking through a dark season contemplating taking life and found joy in Jesus. Completely transformed a renewed mind and spirit. 
We serve a God who makes the impossible possible. And that door only opens when we place our faith in Jesus. His belief opens the door for the unbelievable. And we see this in another scripture. In Mark chapter 9, another moment of healing. When they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe and they ran to greet him. What is all this arguing about Jesus asked? One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought you my son so that you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. Whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground, and then he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirits, but they couldn't do it. Listen how Jesus responds. Jesus said to them, You faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But the evil spirit saw Jesus and it threw the child into a violent convulsion and he fell to the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. How long has this been happening? Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied since he was a little boy. The spirit often throws him into the fire, into water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. What do you mean, if I can, Jesus asked. Anything is, pers- is possible if a person believes. The father instantly cried out, I do believe. Father, help me overcome my belief. Anything is possible if a person believes. It doesn't say if it's cancer. It doesn't say if it's this certain level of brokenness. It doesn't say if they're this far gone. It says anything is possible if a person believes because when you have faith, when you believe, you are releasing authority over the situation to the Father and what's in your hands may be impossible but when it's in the Father's it becomes possible. As you stand with me the Father broken and I can only imagine can only imagine the emotions, the desperation in his voice, the desperation in his heart. He's been demon possessed since he was a little boy, throwing himself into a fire. Can you imagine watching your child or any other child walk through that? And he finds the disciples and he asks them to bring healing. And even the disciples couldn't make it happen. And Jesus looks at them and says, you faithless people. Scripture teaches me that you can be as close and near to the things of God that you want, but if you don't embrace the Father in a relationship with Him, it means nothing. You can go to church, you can serve, you can tithe, you can read and check off all these boxes, but if in your heart you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ, it means nothing. He wants an intimate relationship with you. And I believe that there's somebody in this room or you're facing a situation in your life. It may be personal, it may be family, it may be work, it may be you need to stand in the gap for someone else. But you're facing a situation in your life and you want to believe with all of your heart that God is going to provide, that he is going to move, that he is going to show up in a radical way. But you're crying out, Jesus, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. Because the enemy loves to whisper in our ears and say, he's not going to do it. This is too big. Or maybe he says to you, you're not worth him moving for. Why would he move in your life? Like, you don't deserve that. Why? He, doesn't, he doesn't love you that much. And he whispers these lies in your ear that start to feed that unbelief. I believe that the Lord wants to grow somebody's faith this morning. What we're going to do, we did this in first service. We're going to come to this altar in just a moment. I love this altar, and we clean every part except for the front of this because you get to see the stains of the tears because what is an altar? It is a raised service where we lay down sacrifices to the Father. And in the scripture, even with Abraham, They use his faith as a template for the believer. But what the scripture says is that Abraham's actions are what perfected his faith. 
that sometimes you've got that little bit of unbelief, but then taking that step forward in faith is what grows it. And what I'm going to ask us to do is I want every single person in this room, we are going to surround this altar. We're going to open ourselves to the Lord for five minutes and just say, God, help me overcome my unbelief. Maybe you need hope in a hopeless situation. Maybe you need strength and discernment and wisdom to walk in a life of righteousness. Whatever it may be, I want you to come to this altar. And I believe God is going to grow your faith today. And some of you are like, well, Pastor Wes, I'm a little type B and these chairs are my comfort zone. I can tell you there's a common denominator in every scripture. And it's not that when people stayed comfortable, Jesus moved. It's when they released authority and they stepped into vulnerability. And they said, this isn't where I'm in control, but God, it's yours. That's when he does his best work. I want to encourage you to come to this altar. And when we come up here, I want to press in and spread all the way across so that we can get everybody up in the aisles. And I'm believing for God to move, to grow your faith, to grow your hope, and to build up your life of righteousness this morning. We are a church that will always remain open to the move of the Holy Spirit. For it is by... For the Holy Spirit, we are here. We are not here just to say simple things, to walk out of the room in hopes for the, to receive the gift of heaven. But we are here to have our lives changed daily by the Holy Spirit. And I'm believing for him to meet you at this altar. Help you overcome your unbelief. Build your hope. And to help you walk in righteousness. Heavenly Father, I pray. God, I pray as we approach this altar as a sign of sacrifice. We're laying aside our comfort. We're laying aside control of a situation. God, whatever it may be, I pray as we place our faith in our hope in you that you would move, that you would grow our faith like you did Abraham because of our step forward and our trust in you, God. There's somebody in this room who's standing in front of a situation that seems hopeless. God, that it seems like the child, the dream, the provision, the promise, the answers is dead on the floor. But God, you know the answer is never dead as long as you are still in control. So I pray we would give that control to you today. We place our faith in you, not in man. We place our hope in you and not in man. That there is no thing that can bring hope and build faith and provide righteousness like you do. So you are why we are here. To experience the renewing of our mind and our spirit by you. So God, as we approach this altar, may you change our hearts. May we see dead dreams come to life. May we see visions be birthed and new and strengthened. May we see hearts made whole. May we see hope brought to this place. May we see depression replaced with joy. May we see anxiety replaced with peace. Move in a way that only you can. We're opening the floor to you, Jesus. Your mighty name. Amen. Would you come to the altar this morning as we allow God to build our faith and to bring hope into hopeless situations?